Good afternoon. Uh, this is the talk on the deep dive for cloud and build packs. My name is Terrence Lee. I go by Hone02 on Twitter. I work at a platform as a service company called Heroku. And uh, if you missed uh, or remember the talk from yesterday, uh, this was the build pack API where, so as a build pack author, you need to implement these two executables, uh, detect and build. And then the platform uh, provides basically analysis and exports. And so with detect, uh, this is the part where uh, the build pack will dis uh, write code that will decide if it should run, kind of create a build plan uh, that codifies uh, the build packs that need to be run. Um, and in the build phase, this is kind of the meat of the build pack that actually goes ahead and creates the different OCI layers that will be in your resulting image at the end, as well as a bunch of metadata that gets associated with it. Um, and so with export, uh, this is where the platform actually goes and constructs the uh, image that you can use at the end. And then basically on a subsequent build, like a non-first run, the analysis will go ahead and pull down the different OCI layers that uh, may be needed uh, on that build. And so uh, just a quick overview of the various components. If you go to our build pack uh, GitHub org, uh, you'll see a bunch of different repos. And these are kind of the uh, most important ones, I think, if you're going to be looking into this project. So pack is the one I think we direct most people to uh, first to kind of get started. It's basically the local uh, experience that you can download as a CLI and kind of go ahead and take an app and actually build a, an image out of that uh, with the various images. Um, and it's really just like the best starting point uh, if you're just wanting to learn more about build packs. Um, we have the Knative integration. So uh, there's a template uh, that we've done for Knative build. Uh, Jason Hall helped us uh, do a Tekton template as well. Um, so uh, that's a part of the project. Uh, and we want to keep maintaining basically integration with Knative. Uh, there is a uh, lifecycle repo that basically is the main thing that you'll use to um, as a platform like implement that implements the build pack API v3 spec we'll mention this uh, further on the talk for various things uh, the lib build pack is kind of the main go language binding that we provide so a lot of the build packs that we have implemented as uh, cloud native build packs actually are written in go and um, uh, they just use the lib build pack to kind of make that easier um, uh, we have a spec, which is just the formal specification of the Billpack API, and then the RFCs uh, as a basic place where you can propose substantial changes to the project. Um, and so with that, uh, we're going to dive into kind of the main part of the presentation. So I'm going to go and talk about uh, basically how we've implemented uh, the Heroku Billpack set of things, and then uh, Stephen's going to talk about Cloud Foundry. Um, so to kick this off, uh, I was talking about pack. So here's an example of running a pack build, and then we're passing in basically the Heroku Builder images, or the Heroku Builder image, and it contains all the build packs that we use to run it. And uh, in this uh, thing that we're running, it's building against a Spring Boot application. And so one of the things is that uh, this application doesn't specify any like build pack specific configuration. The build pack can detect that it is a Java application and basically go through and uh, basically install the JDK, run Maven, kind of get that thing running. And then at the end, you get this Docker image that you can run with Docker run. It's really just another OCI image that you can use all the existing tools that you already know and love today with it. Uh, so I was mentioning this builder image that we use uh, basically as part of pack. And so the builder images are a way that we use to kind of, they are a uh, OCI image that basically contains the build packs that, you're going, that are going to be made available when you run pack build uh, or really anything as kind of a containable format there. Uh, it includes the lifecycle that actually goes ahead and does the build. And the lifecycle is also used to basically launch the application uh, when you actually uh, run it with like a Docker run. Um, and so to construct uh, a builder image, uh, there is a builder.tom that basically describes the, the kind of things that go into it. So uh, you're going to list kind of the build packs there, and then as well as, as a stack. And uh, when we talk about a stack, it's broken up into two parts. There's a build image that's used as the context for uh, actually building images, and then the run image that when you actually do that Docker run, like kind of the base image that's being used where your application sits on top of. Um, so kind of stepping through that with the builder.toml, uh, you just have to name your stack. So uh, in the Heroku case, we have a stack called Heroku 18. And then here we're basically as strings pointing to two different Docker images that we have built. And we'll go into like how these images are built. 
And so uh, this is all built on top of, uh, for our, our builder images, a Heroku 18 stack, which we, we maintain as part of a product in production. Um, it's built on top of Basie Bionic, and then here are links to both the source code of how that stuff's constructed, as well as kind of the packages if you're interested in digging into it more. Uh, they're not super important for the rest of this talk. Um, but so we at Heroku provide basically two Docker images uh, that uh, anyone can kind of go and fetch and use uh, as part of the product, uh, unrelated to kind of the Cloud Native Build Packs project. Um, and basically, in our build image, we have development headers that basically we don't make available in our run image because they aren't really needed. Um, but you might need them for compiling native extensions and other things like that. Um, so to go ahead and construct those uh, images that I referenced in the uh, builder.toml, uh, we uh, basically inherit from the, that Heroku build image. Uh, we need to provide, basically create a user that will be used to kind of do all that stuff, as well as basically set some stack information and kind of the label, um, so uh, the build pack knows uh, what stack it's actually running with. Um, and then the run image is going to look really similar, and the only difference here is that uh, the run image uses uh, the run image to inherit from on the Heroku 18 stack side and not the build image. Um, and so with that, if you Docker build both of those Docker files, we have two images that uh, the builder.toml can reference now. Um, and so the kind of the next section um, is going to be all the build packs that you want to have available that uh, when we do the, when we create that builder, that will actually be available uh, in that OCI image. So um, in this case, uh, there's a bunch of build packs in here that I haven't written in code, but here's an example of what that looks like. You need to basically specify the ID of the build pack as well as, well as where you can actually get uh, that build pack. Um, so in this case, I have a Ruby and a proc file one. And then once you've listed all the build packs, you can then basically build groups of uh, build packs being run together as a single kind of chain. So um, we have a Ruby build pack, and then after the Ruby build pack gets run, the proc file build pack will get run. And uh, one of the things uh, that you can do is you can set build packs as optional. So if the detect fails on proc file, the build will still succeed. And so we'll have the resulting image. But if uh, the Ruby build pack, for instance, fails, uh, since it's required, uh, it will actually um, kind of fail the build and proceed to the next group. Um, and so with all that stuff, we have a complete builder.toml that we can use to uh, use pack and run the create builder command. And it goes ahead and, like I was saying, adds all the build packs. It's going to inject uh, the lifecycle binary that we use uh, for the building and launching. Um, it's going to validate that we actually have that user, so it won't let you kind of create a builder image uh, without that stuff. Validates the build pack. Uh, on the stack, uh, creates all the directors you need, and basically kind of sets everything up uh, so you don't have to do that inside of your own um, stack images that you're, link that you're linked to in your builder.toml. And so once we have that, though, these are kind of the Docker images that uh, we've created as part of, of our builder image. So this, this builder image, Heroku build packs 18, is the one that you're going to pass to the dash dash builder flag when you run pack build. Uh, and then it's going to reference these two other ones that we've walked through. Um, and with that, uh, we have uh, here are all the build packs that we actually have as part of the Heroku builder image. So we've written two cloud native build pack specific ones, so the Ruby and Java ones. Um, and then uh, as part of kind of the platform, we already have a bunch of other existing build packs. Um, and we've written basically a shim that allows us to run those V2A build packs um, inside of the V3 launcher and kind of have them all run together. Um, so that's Node, Python, PHP, Go. Um, and so I'm going to walk through kind of uh, the Ruby one. Uh, uh, we've had different goals and designs behind the kind of Cloud Foundry stuff. So you can kind of get a contrast of like what it's like to build a build pack from two different perspectives. So uh, with the Ruby build pack, uh, we had design goals as a company to, uh, there's basically a maintainer who maintains uh, this stuff per language. And uh, there's like the V2 build packs are not going away anytime soon for us. Uh, in production, we have a bunch of customers that are using them. So we wanted to basically have a uh, build pack repo that basically supported both V2 and V3 um, versus just a net new V3 build packs. And we apply patches. We don't have to apply them across like two different repos. Um, so you'll see kind of the different design decisions we've made uh, to kind of hit some of those goals. So. Um, the Heroku build pack as part of detect, basically all it does is it's going to check that a gem file exists because that's kind of the main dependency management system in Ruby. And if it does, it passes. Uh, it doesn't actually write like a build plan or anything. Uh, and you don't need to do stuff that you don't want to do um, as part of that. So uh, you can do pretty simple stuff. And so as part of detect, we actually just have code there to basically check if we're in V2 mode or V3 mode. So we do 
uh, kind of a bunch of this stuff to just make it so we can run v v2 and v3 uh, next to each other uh, with the same code base. Um, and then as part of build, uh, we're going to go through and create a bunch of different layers. Um, in the Ruby case, we're going to create a Ruby layer. Um, and so this goes in a specific directory under the layers folder uh, specific to our build pack that's made available to us. Uh, we're going to set uh, environment variable the path thing so basically we can execute. And so um, basically at runtime, when we launch any Ruby process, it knows where the Ruby binary is as well as if there's a build pack that depends on Ruby kind of down the line, it also has access to the Ruby binary. Um, we're going to set some metadata, which is kind of that cloud looking thing of the Ruby version as well as the stack. So uh, we know basically when we pull this layer down in the future, if we need to rebuild it. So if we're on, if we, on a new stack, you obviously want to uh, replace the binary with a uh, Ruby binary that's actually built for that stack. Um, Kind of the next major layer is kind of the dependencies, which are Ruby gems. Um, so again, similar, uh, we're going to put that in a different layer, which is in a different directory. And then we're just going to set kind of the environment variable. So uh, when we boot the Ruby app, it knows where to actually find that stuff. And then uh, again, metadata stuff. So we know when to actually basically rebuild this layer uh, if we need to. Um, and Stephen's going to kind of go how all that stuff gets constructed in image. Um, so we don't go through this twice. Gonna, kind of move along. And so this kind of uh, builds kind of the first part, the Ruby part. And so we're going to talk about this proc file build pack uh, as this optional build pack that we're building. And so the Heroku cloud name build pack proc file build pack is really just a compatibility build pack. So this is kind of an example of like how you can build really small functionality to kind of extend things that you want, uh, even though like our Ruby build pack is a pretty massive uh, build pack. Uh, this proc file one is uh, under 100 lines of mostly bash. And so um, uh, if you're not familiar with ProcFile, it's a way on Heroku to basically specify the uh, process type that you want to launch and kind of have that be able to be launched. Um, and so it's pretty simple. You just specify the name of the process type, have a colon, and kind of the command you want to run. Um, and so in our Ruby case, uh, this is what it looks like to build, boot up a Rails app. And so uh, inside of the cloud name build pack spec, we have a launch.toml that has different things you can specify in it, but one of them is a group of processes. And so all this proc file build pack is going to do, it's going to parse that proc file, and it's just going to write out a launch.toml as part of that build process. So uh, when launcher boots up, it knows of the different processes that you can actually launch. Um, and so uh, with that previous proc file, all it does is basically replace the strings and kind of does validation around that. Um, and that's kind of, uh, at the end, this allows us to basically support anything that people are doing uh, today on our platform and actually turn that into a cloud native build pack uh, image. Um, and so with that, um, Steven's now going to talk about uh, Cloud Foundry. Hey, can you hear me? Yeah, awesome. Uh, so I'm Steven. Uh, I work at Pivotal on things related to Cloud Foundry and Kates. Uh, and today I'm going to talk about sort of uh, the primary goal we had for rewriting the Cloud Foundry build packs on top of this new API is really modularity and transparency, that we wanted to break down the build packs into kind of composable pieces that each did you know, one thing. Uh, and the kind of uh, Cloud Native Build Packs v3 API provides um, some nice functionality for letting you break down build packs into smaller parts than the sort of previous build pack implementations did. Um, you can kind of contrast this you know, on the Heroku side. Uh, I think the initial approach was more of you know, build one build pack that's responsible for a lot of things, and that's a fine way to build a build pack too. Um, on our side, we wanted to break it down more and use some of the sort of progressive complexity that you can use within the API. So if you look at our you know, previous Node.js build pack for v2, it's kind of one big monolithic thing. The new Node.js build pack for v3 uh, is kind of three build packs. It's a Node engine build pack, a yarn build pack, and an NPM build pack. And so uh, during the detection phase, you can kind of express this as two groups. Uh, the engine build pack, you know, with the modules installed and processed by Yarn, or the engine build pack and the modules installed and processed by NPM. Uh, and so as a kind of a reminder, build pack detection is sort of this mechanism for selecting, uh, you know, what build packs might apply to your application, uh, and also selecting the tools and dependencies that go into your application. And those second two things are kind of new in the V3 API. The detection process is actually, that, that whole initial part is also responsible for coming up with a plan for what's going to happen during the build, called the build plan. 
Uh, and so to kind of run through what this looks like with Cloud Foundry, we have the Node.js build pack, engine build pack running first, and it says, uh, hey, you know, I just do one thing. I don't understand package JSON because that's an NPM you know, configuration file or a Yarn configuration file. Uh, and uh, so my job is just I'm going to provide the Node.js engine itself if another build pack asks for it. And I'm going to pass because who knows, it might. And if nobody else asks for it, then that's great. I'm not going to do anything. The Yarn build pack runs and fails immediately because there's no Yarn lock here. So move on to the next group. Uh, so that group doesn't happen. We move on to the next group. Um, so the Node engine build pack runs again. Same thing. OK, we're good. And then the NPM build pack runs, and it reads package JSON, because that's NPM configuration. And it says, oh, I found this Node engine version. So I know we need to install Node.js 10.3.1, and I'm going to add that to the build plan for the Node.js build pack. And so that group is selected, and we have our build plan, and we proceed to the build phase. And so uh, at this point, and just as a reminder, the build phase is kind of a, it's an unprivileged, so it runs in unprivileged containers and produces reproducible images, and it constructs these, image in, these images incrementally um, just by generating new layers that don't need to change from the previous build. It doesn't even need to download old layers. Kind of, it's very different from the Docker file model. It's sort of designed to be as efficient as possible, given that we can you know, kind of put code up front on the build pack side. Uh, and so to kind of run through that build process, the build plan is fed into the Node.js engine build pack, which kind of claims that entry. Uh, and it uh, creates these, um, you know, creates a Node.js layer that has, uh, you know, Node.js in it and sets up the environment a little bit for things to be able to use it. Um, it uh, if you look at these layer paths here, it's kind of interesting. You know, the reason we can kind of incrementally update layers, regardless of what order they're in, is because there's sort of a tight contract for where they live. Uh, and at, at the same time it writes that layer, it writes some metadata about what, um, what's in the layer so that later it can look back at that and say, oh, you know, the remote image in the registry, it already has this layer. I don't need to rebuild it if it needs to. Uh, and then the NPM build pack runs, and it doesn't get uh, the build plan because the entry was claimed by the Node.js build pack. If you had many more build packs, you have it's sort of more entries passed along. Uh, and when the NPM build pack runs, it generates the node modules layer um, kind of with the uh, you know, path set up sort of so that you have modules and a node path exported separately. Uh, and then it writes metadata that in this case is the SHA-256 sum of the package JSON lock so that it can tell, hey, your package lock didn't change. I'm not going to uh, regenerate the modules next time. Uh, and so then all of these components that were generated are kind of uh, combined together to create an OCI image. So you have the layers and the application uh, layer um, you know, being stored as file system layers in the image, and then you have the metadata and the build plan stored in the image metadata. And that's, that's the final OCI image that gets generated. It's more than two layers. It's just kind of grouping everything together there. And then on a rebuild, um, you know, uh, say the build happens again, you might not need to regenerate that Node.js layer. You may just need to rebuild the Node modules. Uh, so doesn't, uh, you know, a question we get, and kind of as we were building this out, we realized it might be a problem, is uh, kind of decomposing build packs into smaller groups makes distributing them and kind of interacting with them a challenge. So if you have all these groups, like for our Python build pack, where it's even more complicated, you know, we support all these different kinds of package managers, how would you say, I want to put an APM agent, you know, before every single one of those? That seems like a lot of extra configuration. It might be good to, we had an abstraction to represent these groups of build packs. Um, and so that abstraction is the distribution specification, which there's an RFC out for right now. That should come up in the next version for kind of defining these build modules as groups of build packs. So kind of coming from that Python configuration, we kind of simplify it into runtime build pack, a package manager's meta build pack that references those other build packs, and a Conda build pack, because Conda kind of does its own thing. Uh, and altogether, that can be represented by a Python ecosystem build pack. And so if you want to you know, have your APM agent or security scanner build pack or whatever run around that, you just say, yep, this runs before that, and you're done. Uh, and so you know, same with Node, from the configuration you saw before. Node.js engine, package managers, or just the Node.js ecosystem build pack. Um, you don't have to read this toml here, but to kind of give you a sense of what that looks like underneath, each uh, kind of modular build pack can have its own little piece of configuration that says, this is my version, here's some metadata about my build pack. Uh, and then you can define these sort of meta build packs on the uh, right-hand side of the diagram, or toml, <laughs> uh, that kind of define uh, you know, build packs that are composed of other build packs. 
And the highlighted one at the bottom is the uh, ecosystem build pack. Uh, and so I think the, the next sort of uh, really significant part of this new distribution specification is kind of the ability to dynamically construct builders automatically. Um, and this kind of starts with a, a file format that's just, uh, you know, each build pack represented as an individual layer. Um, with the constituent build packs as symlinks inside of that layer. It's kind of a non-runnable OCI image, or it can be exported to a .cnb file, um, which is just an exported OCI image that you can kind of you know, uh, transfer places if you don't have a registry available. And then you can take this and then put it on top of a stack that all of the build packs support to get a builder image. And you can do that. You can actually do this whole process dynamically on a registry, where you just update the registry, you create a new manifest dynamically on the registry that points to the existing layers. So it's just like it's very easy to dynamically generate a builder uh, on the registry that supports the build packs you want to support. And this is a way you could support a large platform with many, many build packs uh, so, you could, so users could build kind of on whatever stack they want whatever, with whatever build packs they want, but also have predefined configurations that an operator could set up um, that an operator could also easily generate to you know, allow a group of developers to use particular language technologies. And so I'm going to turn it to, over to Terrence for the roadmap. Thanks. Uh, so uh, Stephen uh, talked about the distribution RFC, which is kind of the next big thing that we've been talking a bunch about uh, since our summit two months ago. Um, and as he alluded as well, with the build pack registry, we have not built that yet. But um, uh, the hope is to have a central place where uh, people can register build packs, as well as uh, I think the kind of very attractive thing is the dynamic generation of uh, basic builder images, um, since uh, those all that information will be there, and a lot of it will just be quickly just writing that metadata file so we don't have to basically rebuild all these images. Um, in addition to that, uh, we're looking to basically remove dependencies on things that it takes to run build packs so we can support uh, basically scratch or smaller images to, for cases where people care about that. Um, we want to add support in our specification for Windows containers uh, as well. Um, kind of the next big thing. Um, that kind of adds a lot of more functionality is uh, mix-in support. And so what we mean by this is kind of a contract for how to extend uh, stack images to support additional packages. Uh, so right now with build packs, um, you kind of have to specify what stacks you support. Um, so with mix-ins, this will allow you to basically add additional packages but still have those build packs be able to run on kind of different configurations of that stack image. Um, and uh, Finally, like inline build packs, uh, this is the concept of being able to like inside of your uh, project or application that is not a build pack repo, but like this is what you're using uh, to the source code you're running your build packs against to actually be able to specify inline build packs. So if you have like something smaller or a piece of thing that's only specific to your particular uh, project, uh, you can have a build pack that just lives as part of that source code uh, as part of your build pipeline. And then potentially if it grows and you start using it, you can extract it. Uh, but not having to basically, I think one of the limitations today of the current non-cloud native build pack ecosystem is that it's kind of a pain to want to extend that system because you have to create a whole new repo with all this other stuff. Uh, so good support around inline build packs and kind of minimizing the amount of files and things you actually need to write to make that happen. Uh, we have a bunch of other stuff in the roadmap, but these are kind of the high-level things I thought uh, was worth talking about. Um, and so in addition to that, uh, we've been working with uh, various uh, projects and providers for basically integrating build packs uh, with their systems. Uh, obviously, Steve and I worked at Cloud Foundry and Heroku, so uh, we're working on platform integrations there. Um, we have the template that we talked about for Knative Tecton. Um, uh, Riff is a functions as a service um, on top of Knative. Uh, and they basically are all built on top of build packs for kind of constructing images. And so they use the CNB V3, like the build pack V3 uh, Cloud Foundry build packs, as well as they have their own set of basically function build packs that allows them to uh, not have to duplicate that functionality that already exists as part of the Cloud Foundry build packs, but then extend it uh, by turning those things into basically FAS images that they could run inside of Riff. Uh, Doku is a project that uh, basically allows you to have a PaaS in a single machine, more or less. Um, and so uh, they already have a Heroku-ish Docker image, but uh, they were at uh, the build pack summit a 
two months ago, and so we were talking to them about what it would look like to basically move from the current V2 uh, A build pack support they have to a the V3 cloud name build pack model. Um, uh, Draft was also represented at the summit that we had, um, and potentially talking about build packs, how they can extend the current uh, template support that they're doing with Docker files. Um, and maybe some of you in the room are also involved with various open source projects or things in your company, uh, whether that's a public product or an internal thing, um, but we'd be happy to talk to you uh, about how you can integrate build packs uh, uh, with your platform. Um, so. Uh, either come talk to us after the talk, or uh, we have a Slack uh, that you can join where that's where uh, we actually coordinate and talk about things um, across our various companies. And then uh, we also have a mailing list that's provided by the CNCF. Um, and so uh, if you haven't checked it out, uh, definitely the easiest way, like I've said before, is to use the PAC CLI, uh, which if you go to github.com slash buildpack slash pack, uh, under releases, you just go download it. Or if you're on a Mac, you can, I think, brew install it, because um, we had support for that. So uh, you'll have access to the, the builder images and build packs that we've talked about through this talk to actually kind of bootstrap and see what that looks like so you're not starting from nothing. Um, and then all that stuff is based on top of Bionic today. So. Uh, with that, uh, I will open it up for questions. And if uh, anything was confusing today or it was too kind of in-depth, uh, watch the intro talk too. It should be on YouTube after the uh, presentation. <laughs> cool. Any questions? Let the silence permeate for a few minutes. There we go back there. <laughs> Yeah, so we dynamically construct. We should probably repeat the question. Oh yeah, sorry. To repeat the question, uh, you know, how do we construct layers with, uh, for instance, like how do we construct the layer that has the Ruby runtime in, in it, uh, and you know, to build that OCI image, and so part of the, you know, kind of a in really interesting part of our project is that we're kind of creating OCI images using uh, kind of our own tooling and uh, a Google library called Go Container Registry. Uh, so we, we can generate uh, OCI images directly on a registry without a Docker daemon, without uh, you know, any capabilities or privileges needed, uh, without anything like Builder or, or Conoco, um, just by constructing layers manually at, you know, as uh, you know, TGZs, which are just, just what layers are, and exporting them out to the registry or to the local Docker daemon if you want to kind of use a Docker daemon with it. Um, and so, so the Ruby build pack would generate that layer uh, in a directory, uh, kind of like in an easy way without the full pads, uh, and then it would, uh, the kind of build pack lifecycle takes care of wrapping it up into a layer and sending it off. So you don't have to implement the talking to the registry yourself if you're implementing a build pack. Does that make sense? Yeah, so uh, the Cloud Foundry build packs support fully offline builds by including, uh, like we have kind of two versions of each build pack, one that's packaged to include all of, it's like uh, two of the last patch versions of all of the supported lines of every dependency. So they're like a gigabyte each maybe. Uh, so you can build completely offline in unprivileged containers and all that stuff in a you know, isolated environment with all the security stuff you want. <laughs> um, the Heroku build packs support a lot more versions of things, but they download them from kind of known S3 buckets that are provided by Heroku. Correct me if I'm wrong. Yeah, I mean, we have, uh, the only thing we really have in there are like the binaries, uh, like the actual Ruby runtimes we build, as well as uh, like Bundler and other things that are kind of dependent on it. Uh, when you're actually doing bundle install to fetch libraries, we hit literally what the gem file tells us to hit. So most of the times that's going to be Ruby gems. But I mean, if you had a private server that you had, like in our private spaces product, for instance, if you had a thing that you could you just want to hit that thing, uh, you could specify that in your gem file. Buildpack could also build everything from source during the build process if it really wanted to, but because of the sort of approved stack model we have, you don't have to, and your builds can be much faster. You don't have to worry about building everything up, you know, during the build process for each app. Cool. Awesome question. What's up? How is it easiest to swap out the OS? So uh, are we really married to Ubuntu 
like a hierarchy where you're assuming a little bit from the top? Or is it more mixed in like so, so the question is, how easy is it to swap out the operating system layers? Uh, I think there's like, do you mean like uh, swap out Ubuntu with CentOS, or like swap out Ubuntu with a new ABI compatible security patch version of Ubuntu? Got it. So the, the specification and the tooling doesn't have a preference of Ubuntu or CentOS or whatever, uh, but the build packs individually support uh, operating system layers because the binaries are built on top of those operating system layers. Um, so in the case of Heroku and Cloud Foundry, we do Ubuntu and Bionic and Xenial, I think, or? Yeah, we do Bionic we and Xenial. Yeah. Um, and so, so right now, if you're using these particular build packs, then you know, you're you, you have to use Ubuntu, but if you make your own on top of CentOS, that should work great. The contract is defined agnostic of all that stuff, if that makes sense. Yeah, and then, and then when we're talking about uh, support for scratch images, it's mostly uh, there's some stuff that is dependent on, like, with the Profile D and other things as part of the specification that kind of requires a POSIX-style environment. Um, but, yeah, I mean, there's nothing hard-coded that forces you to use a particular flavor of Linux or anything. Um, that is really entirely up to the build packs that are written against them, right? So like the Heroku build packs, we just build them in the context that we assume that stuff is on the stack image. The build pack author has access to those binaries or tools, but I mean, you could easily write build packs that are limited to or extended with uh, whatever you need there. Uh, we we're even were one dependency away in the spec from supporting uh, scratch images also. So you can have no operating system layers if you want to, uh, hopefully in the next version, too. Cool. Any other questions? We still got some time. Over there. Yeah, so mixins are a contract for defining kind of base images that have more stuff than the build pack kind of intends to know about uh, so that you can say, like, uh, I have my, you know, CF uh, official Bionic stack that has a few dependencies on it, but for my application, I'm going to create a version that has these extra, you know, image processing related packages, and it'll still work with the CF build packs, and that's kind of the first step. Eventually, we'd like to do sort of more automated support for, you know, my app needs these OS packages, just make sure they're there. Um, but, you know, it's it, because we're trying to preserve this sort of ABI compatibility contract between the application layers and the operating system layers, so you can swap the operating system out without rebuilding it. Um, the, uh, you know, that it makes, it adds challenges to adding those operating system packages because they have to come in with those stack layers initially. There's no, you know, good contract for installing them. That's a great question. We don't think, because uh, operating system packages can run arbitrary code when they get installed in many cases, um, you know, we've, we've been through a lot of iterations of is it possible to layerize all the packages, <laughs> you know, be able to install them, but we don't think you can do it safely. Uh, you know, we, we can come up with some bad security scenarios where you install this pack packages in the wrong order and you're missing a user or, you know, your user doesn't have a password or something. Um, so, uh, you know, it, currently the plan is you'll be able to extend a stack image and it'll, you'll have to use a Docker file to install additional packages or other tooling to extend the image with additional packages using the package manager. Cool. Does that make sense? Cool. Any other questions? All right. Thanks, everybody. Yeah, thank you.